Hey, Dr. Alton here, uh, fourth episode of our HIP series, and really excited tonight. We have a special guest, Dr. Halliman's joining us. And Dr. Halliman is not only one of my really good friends, but uh, also our practices overlap a fair bit. Um, Dr. Halliman's a HIP preservation specialist. So he has the distinct honor of having done two fellowships. Uh, one of those was in sports surgery where um, basically you learn how to do arthroscopic surgery and take care of things in a minimally invasive way. And then he went over and actually traveled to Europe uh, where they've pioneered a lot of hip preservation and the thought process behind it. And he learned from some of the literal world experts in hip preservation. And so um, his practice now and my practice overlap a bit in that I do a, a fair number of hip replacements and he does a fair number of hip preservation, which um, is not only some of the arthroscopic things, but also some of the open procedures. And he's agreed to help share his expertise with us tonight. So I'm really excited to hear some of his content and we'll have a little back and forth uh, between us as he's talking through some of these topics. And then at the end, he has agreed to make himself available for some live question and answer like we have done with some of the other series. So uh, Sean, thanks for taking the time out of your evening. And uh, thanks to your wife for letting you get away from the small kids and spend some time sharing with us uh, your expertise in hip preservation. So please um, let us hear what you have to say. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I think that's maybe a little bit nicer of an introduction than uh, is deserved, but I appreciate it nonetheless. And uh, so I kind of just wanted to highlight for this hip series, which I think is a fantastic uh, thing you have going here, some of the non-arthritic causes of hip pain um, that sometimes may require some surgical treatment and sometimes they may not. And so I put together a little presentation and we'll go through that now. Um, so uh, when, I, when I think about the hip, I like to think of it in layers and uh, I've laid out a couple of those layers here. We start with the deepest layers, the joint, the actual bone and cartilage um, and the pain that you can get from that, from different pathologies or problems uh, or hip impingement, uh, dysplasia, and we'll go over all this so you don't have to uh, get hooked on these terms. Um, we'll talk about labral tears, which is a pretty hot topic, and uh, just general joint inflammation. The next layer outside of that would be tendons and muscles, uh, the things that move the hip in space. And then beyond that, there's other layers of the nerves and then the skin and the soft tissue above that. So there's a lot of things that potentially could be causing pain around the hip that's not necessarily in the joint um, as well. Um, so here are some of the other just random possibilities that you can get. And we have to keep in mind that there's not only overlap between what Dr. Alton and I do in the hip world, but there's also some general surgery things involved like hernias that can uh, masquerade as hip pain. Uh, there can be some pinch nerves in the back that uh, are referred pain sites that we just need to make sure we have an appropriate plan and uh, set in action. So uh, we'll start kind of with the common one that I see a lot of, and that's hip impingement, or FAI is what we call it uh, in medical terms. And that's basically where you just have excessive bone, more so than the standard person has, and that restricts motion a little bit in the hip. And when your motion is restricted, you still try to get a full range of motion. What that does is damage the cartilage and eventually the labrum in the hip and that's what causes pain. There are two main types of hip impingement. Uh, there's the cam type, uh, which is named for a lobe on a camshaft, but you can see the circle there. There's too much bone on the femur. And so anytime that big bump tries to enter the socket, it pushes the labrum up and out of the way and peels the cartilage away from the bone like you can see in this picture here. The red line denotes where the labrum is and you can see my probe uh, pushing in on the cartilage surface and you can see that that cartilage is getting peeled away from the labrum and the labrum is getting peeled away from the bone. And so that's the typical pattern of injury we see with a cam type impingement. The other type of uh, impingement is pincer, and that's where there's too much bone on the socket side. So you can see in gray here, they've added a little extra bone in this cartoon. And so when the hip tries to flex up, meaning when you're sitting down or you're trying to bend in deep, that neck of the, of the femur bone of the hip comes in contact with the socket. 
And what that does is crush the labrum. So in this scenario, you can see the bruising on the upper portion of the labrum because it constantly gets crushed every time the person bends down. Now, Dr. Hallman, um, I commonly see these people once that cartilage loss is complete and then we do a hip replacement, um, but you, you commonly see them much sooner. Are people born like this or is this something that develops over time? Um, what's your understanding of that? It's actually a combination of uh, both of those. So there's a big genetic component, but there's also activity level when you're younger. So we know that it's more common in young males who tend to participate more in high impact activities. And they tend to develop that cam sort of impingement more frequently than women do. And women, on the other hand, tend to have that pincer. And that tends to be just more of your anatomy that you're born with and not something that's created over time. Got it. Uh, so uh, when these people present, they typically will complain of pain in the groin. Uh, that's the most common area. It's more common in seated positions or when people are getting deep into squats or lunges or climbing up hills, anything that really brings that hip up so the two bones can come in contact. Um, and we'll, we'll frequently see that transitional pain too from a deep seated position to standing as a cause of the now on the other end of the spectrum, there's hip dysplasia or a socket that's too shallow. So side by side comparison here, you see a couple of x-rays on uh, the screen's left. So if you're viewing straight onto the screen, that's a normal x-ray. And you can see that that red line is matching up with the end of the socket and it covers a large portion of that head of the femur. Whereas on the right side, you can see the edge of that socket barely makes it to 50% coverage of that head. And so that's what dysplasia looks like in the hip. And what happens there is you get what we call some micro instability of the hip where it slides around a little bit more than it normally should. And that puts a lot of stress on the labrum and eventually over time, the labrum will just give out and tear or the cartilage in that upper outer portion of the socket will start to wear down and then the labrum will tear. And so it kind of just depends on the severity. This is someone with a borderline hip dysplasia. Um, and if you've seen a lot of these, you can tell on this one that this labrum is actually larger than the normal labrum. And we see that in people with dysplasia because since they don't have enough bone to cover the socket, the body tries to make it up with the labrum. And eventually that tissue just wears out because it's not quite as strong as the bone. And you can see that tearing away from the, from the bone again in that picture. And Sean, this is something that people are born, more born with this or they get it early on in their development. Is that right? And then they're just kind of like this and then the hip wears out. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely one of the things that you're born with. And um, uh, some parents out there probably know about the Pavlik harness. It's usually diagnosed early on when it's severe and kids have to uh, go into a little harness to help their hip shape appropriately. Now, some people aren't quite bad enough early on, so it's not caught. And then throughout their life, it develops with that shallowness. And then depending right. on when the pain starts is when they're seen for it. And Sean and I both have small kids, but I remember the, the pediatrician at some of those very first visits, they take their little hips and they move them around and they're feeling trying to identify this condition early on uh, to try yep. and treat it so that you don't get to be an adult and have all these problems. That's interesting. Yep. Um, and so this is probably the most common cause actually of young adult arthritis. So we're talking people definitely under 45, uh, a great majority of those people that end up having re hip replacements under 45 probably had some sort of hip dysplasia because uh, it does tend to create some rapid wear of the cartilage later on in life. <clears throat> um, this pain is a little bit different. So whereas impingement is more of a seated type of pain or when you're kind of deep in a squatting position, this one tends to be more painful when you're upright since there's no bone to cover uh, that head as it's sliding around. When you put the pressure down when you're stepping, that's when it slides and does the tearing of the labrum. So pain is typically worse upright walking and especially any running or high impact activities. Um, some people say they feel their hips sliding around a little bit and a lot of people get pain with the muscles surrounding the hip because all those muscles are trying to help support it. So we see a lot of lateral hip pain or meaning outside of the hip, that bone that you feel on the outside of your thigh. Um, those muscles are overworking and get a lot of, a lot of pain out there. Um, 
So the next question I get quite a bit is what is the labrum? Because we'll get uh, some MRI reports and they'll say if there's a labral tear and they just kind of want to know what that is. And so the labrum is kind of like an O-ring really. Um, you can see a little cross section of it here. It looks like a little triangle, but it does go around the entire hip socket almost. Um, and it creates a little bit of extra stability in the hip. It also creates what we call a suction seal, which adds to the stability, but also maintains the fluid pressure inside the hip. And so we think disruption of that probably is some of the source of the pain. Um, so what causes a labral tear? Well, we just talked about two of the most common causes and that's uh, hip impingement and dysplasia. Um, age and arthritis. And, and Dr. Alton, you could probably speak to this more, but I imagine when you go in there to replace hips, there's not a very good labrum left over. Yeah, most of the time it's pretty worn away by the time we get in there. There's not much left or a remnant of it. Or um, when I'm doing a hip replacement on one of those dysplastic younger patients like you're talking about, you can really appreciate that extra thick labral tissue that's commonly present and commonly torn. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so this picture that you see here is an arthroscopic picture uh, of, of early stage arthritis. You can see that little shallow picture of the head right out here still has some decent cartilage, but this is all gone here. This is a big flap of cartilage tissue that's no longer adhered to the bone. And so labral tears and arthritis, it's kind of the, the chicken and the egg, uh, uh, so to speak, you know, what comes first. Um, ultimately, in the end, it doesn't really matter because once you get to this amount of arthritis, you're probably better off having a hip replacement anyway. You can't really fix that with your yeah. arthroscope. No, you can do some fancy stuff and try to get some cartilage to regrow, but it's a pretty yeah. high stress zone. And so a hip replacement probably does the best job long term. There's some other uncommon causes of, of labral tears, pure trauma. So if someone dislocates their hip, it's pretty hard to do that, uh, but that's certainly gonna cause a tear in the labrum. You can get some rubbing from the iliopsoas tendon that eventually uh, probably causes inflammation related tearing of the labrum. And the same with what we call subspine impingement. This just means one of the areas of your pelvis bone is a little bit bigger than normal. Um, that's not in the hip socket, but that can cause some labral tearing as well. And so the other thing is, does a labral tear actually cause any hip pain? And uh, that's kind of a yes and no answer. So on one hand, we do know that the labrum, especially where it tends to tear, has a fair amount of nerves uh, and pain fibers. And so that certainly can be cause of pain. But we also know that you can get an MRI and have what looks like a labral tear on the MRI, but have no symptoms at all. In fact, we've had several studies with just healthy volunteers who've never experienced any hip pain get a hip MRI that shows a labral tear. So just having that alone without any other clinical findings is not something we like to chase after. Um, we also know that the labrum deteriorates as we age, like we talked about with arthritis, and those chronic tears tend not to produce the same pain as a hip impingement or a, a hip dysplasia type of tear would cause. And, and you're probably more likely getting pain just from the general arthritis and inflammation of the joint than just a labral tear in that situation. So how do we diagnose the cause of hip pain since there are so many? Uh, well, we rely a lot on your history of the pain and, and what you're feeling, the quality of the pain, uh, the quantity of the pain, where it's located. Uh, you see this person putting his thumb and index finger, we call this the C sign, and that just means that it's somewhere deep in there. Front to back, you could, you could poke it with a hot knife and that's where the pain is. <clears throat> and that's pretty typical of, of more joint type of pain. And then we do a physical exam, put you through various maneuvers, watch you walk, see you do some different things because those help elicit whether the pain's coming from in the joint or maybe it's one of the muscles around the joint that's really causing all the problems and we don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Then we'll typically get some x-rays because that shows us a lot. This picture shows us a pretty big cam deformity you can see right here. So normally if you look at this undersurface, there should be a big dip between the radius of the head and the neck and you see that on the back side of the femur, but here you see a big bump right there. So we know that's a cam. And if there's any pain with impingement, then we have ways to address it. Then we'll usually get an MRI because that shows us the soft tissues a little bit better. You can see that outlined here. There's a little nice arrow sign there pointing to the labral tear on this 
person's hip MRI. And then we talk about treatment. So uh, we can treat labral tears and we can treat impingement and dysplasia without surgery. And a lot of times that means physical therapy. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting some increased strength around the hip and the core to get the pelvis in a better position that you can avoid having pain in the hip and have a normal functioning hip. And we're certainly not gonna operate on you with a labral tear if you don't have any pain. And so that's kind of the goal. We know that pain in and of itself will shut down the, the muscles that surround the hip joint. And so if we can wake those back up and get you some more stability just with your own strength, that's kind of an ideal way to treat it. Um, so some other options we do do injections, steroid injections help with the inflammation. Sometimes you're just stuck in this cycle of inflammation in the hip that uh, the tear inflames the joint lining and joint lining puts out more fluid and back and forth you go uh, and the steroid injection is good at calming that down. I've had a couple people get one injection and, and say it's all their hip pain forever. So that's always a potential option. And Dr. Halliman, you, you do those injections, right? In the office? Yeah, we do those under ultrasound, so we know exactly where uh, the injection's going. The nice thing about them is they're also diagnostic. So we put numbing medication in there, and if we're at all concerned about is this a muscle around the hip or is it in the hip joint itself, by directing that needle into the hip joint and giving that numbing medication, if the pain goes away, then it's a slam dunk. We know that all that pain's coming from the hip joint, and it's one of those things we just discussed that's the problem. But if we give you that injection and there's no pain relief, then we got to start looking elsewhere. So it's helpful yeah. for two reasons, potentially therapeutic and potentially helps us with the diagnosis. Yeah, that's a great point, man. And I do that from time to time. And actually pretty commonly, I'm like, hey, go see Dr. Halliman. He can put this medicine right there. And that'll really give us a lot of information because from, from my standpoint, the last thing I ever want to do, well, one of the last things I ever want to do is replace somebody's hip if the pain's not coming from their hip. Because I, I mean, I can make an x-ray look beautiful, but if your pain's coming from something else, you know, then it's not going to help you at all. So uh, yeah. thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. And then there's some more alternative types of injections that uh, are kind of in early phases of studies that we offer, um, uh, like PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, where you take your own blood and spin it down to the platelets in the plasma. The theory behind that, especially with early arthritis, uh, is that it can has a pretty powerful anti-inflammatory benefit. I think in the knee, in a couple of series, it's been shown to last longer uh, than a steroid injection that may take longer to work. Uh, but these again are all not currently covered by insurance. And so there's a little bit of risk associated with those. Um, and then surgery. So uh, for Impingement in particular, um, we can go in there arthroscopically with a little camera, a couple of small incisions. We can go find that labral tear and you can see there a little bit of a couple of threaded ropes are wrapped around the labrum uh, right in this area right here. And that's how we repair the labrum. You can see the tearing underneath. And what that does is compress the labrum against the bone and give it a chance to heal in the appropriate position. Um, and we almost never will go in there arthroscopically and just fix a labrum because usually, like we talked about, there's an underlying problem that causes those labral tears. So we'll fix that at the same time too. If you have too much bone on the socket, we would shave down some of this bone up here. If it was too much bump uh, on the neck of the femur, like with those cam deformities, then we would shave that down also. And so that's what this is showing here. You can see on this picture here, you got a big old bump, and then this is after surgery. You got a nice smooth contour, more of a round head. And so you can imagine when this hip went up and in, it was pushing up against that labrum every time. And now when this one goes in, it's got a lot of room to clear. So um, that's the type of stuff we do arthroscopically. Now dysplasia, um, we treat similarly. We try all the non-operative methods with uh, physical therapy and injections if you're a little bit older. Now, young people with severe dysplasia that are starting to have signs of pain, you're probably going to do one of these hip preservation procedures sooner because you don't want the cartilage damage to progress too much further. So this is... Um, open surgery. This is a fairly large surgery. You can see these are immediately post-op. What we do is we have to break the bone around the socket so that we can reorient it to give you more coverage over the top of your femur. Uh, and that really helps uh, reduce the stress on the labrum. It helps even out 
the stress across the cartilage so it reduces that risk to be needing a hip replacement later on. But this is a bigger surgery, no doubt about it. Um, and then you might have dysplasia and you might just be a better off with a total hip replacement. And this is, I think, where we have a significant number of crossover also is if you're starting to get into your 40s and 50s and you're having hip dysplasia, there might seem like there's some joint space, but then we get an MRI and we see some signs of cartilage where maybe we see little cysts in the bone or, or we see that the, the cartilage in a specific area is thin. So maybe globally on x-ray it looks okay, but on MRI there's a certain area that doesn't look so good. And I think um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but these people tend to do a lot better with the total hip replacement than they do a big hip preservation surgery. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the literature would support that. I think this is one of the areas where our understanding of this pathology has progressed um, rather recently. And I know that my indications for hip replacement based on MRI findings have expanded as we start to understand this more. And also, you know, the more patients we see with these full thickness areas of cartilage loss on the MRI, even if they have preserved joint space on the x-ray, but you've got a bunch of bony edema in the femoral head and on the pelvic side, they actually, um, in general, at least in, in sort of my experience, have done really, really well with hip replacement. So um, it just tends to be sort of how symptomatic are you and how painful is this? And you know, is there an anatomic reason that justifies putting you through the operation? So yeah, I totally agree with you on that one, Sean. What do you tell people, a uh, 40-year-old with pretty bad dysplasia that has signs on MRI of arthritis about the longevity of the implant? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. I actually just saw this past week one of my you know one of these patients that I really really like, and she is in her 30s, and she has um, some small kids, and she has dysplastic hips, exactly like you're talking about, you know, labral tears, but some areas of full thickness cartilage loss. And so we had this really uh, sort of challenging discussion, uh, but very meaningful as well, um, in terms of, boy, I've had a bunch of injections, I have an anatomic reason for this pain, and I'm not a candidate for a hip preservation um, procedure. And, you know, I'm in my 30s, I, I've got these kids and I can't, I can't keep up with them, my quality of life is really suffering. And so we kind of do this, you know, weigh the risks and benefits of, you know, if you get a hip replacement now and say last 20 to 30 years, which, you know, they're, they're lasting so much longer than they used to just by the advances in the implants that, you know, that gets you your 30s, that gets you your 40s, that gets you your 50s with good quality of life. And then, you know, if we have to go in, in your sixties, you know, decades down the road and swap out some parts or do, do a revision, then we do that. Um, so it's really just sort of a pros and cons analysis of quality of life now versus potentially needing a revision in the future. So, you know, those are, those are conversations that, that I, I appreciate having with patients. It's not an easy decision, you know, and oftentimes, you know, they'll, they'll go see you uh, and then they'll go see me and, you know, maybe they go talk to you again or talk to me again. And, you know, we kind of just, it becomes clear what the right path is once you understand the risks and benefits. But to answer your question, you know, they last decades now, you know, 20, 30 years pretty routinely uh, if you get the parts in the right position and you use the modern stuff. So it's a, it's a good option for a lot of patients. Yeah, I think so. And, and the hip preservation literature is pretty clear on that also, I think. I mean, there's always areas for improvement, but um, any signs of arthritis and, and, Pretty bad dysplasia for sure, a good indication for a total hip replacement, yeah. in my opinion. You get less excited about doing an arthroscopic procedure if you see those changes, uh, just because you know the person's still gonna hurt even if you fix the stuff you can fix, is that right? Yeah, that's the worst conversation to have too, especially you know, as much as you try to temper expectations for someone and their recovery, that the hope is always to become pain-free after surgery, and that's always the goal. Uh, and it's just pretty unreliable to offer that with a hip scope with that much arthritis because you know the arthritis is going to be a problem. Yeah. If not right away in six months in a year, it's, it's going to come back. Yeah. So uh, just in lines of what we were talking about, who's not a good candidate? This is a person with big old cam bumps, but no joint space left right here. So you know that the hip preservation is out of the question and is uh, is in need of a total hip replacement for sure. Looks, looks like we got a little notification there. Yeah, we get to keep going. That's great. Go on. Unlimited time. Hey, there you go. 
<laughs> uh, and so this is what we're talking about uh, on the MRI also. So this person, if I see this, this goes to Dr. Alton 10 times out of 10. So I see a lot of bright signal in the head. I see a lot of narrowing of the joint. I see this crazy torn and beat up labrum. I know that I'm not making this person better with anything short of a total hip replacement. Uh, and then the other people that I'm kind of hesitant on arthroscopically is, is just an older patient in general. And that, that's not to be ageist in any way, but I think there's also a path of arthritis that starts well before you see any significant changes on any imaging. So if, if I get someone that's 60 and has a labral tear, not really excited about going in and fixing that arthroscopically um, because the, the literature is pretty clear on this too. The outcomes are not quite as good. And I know uh, the recovery is going to be long. It takes a while for the soft tissues to repair. Um, you get significant muscle weakness after hip surgery. We know this already. And if you're older, just it's harder to build that muscle back up. And you might be stuck in the cycle of just low nagging pain long term, even with the surgery. And so that's not ex something we're excited about providing here. Um, and then patients with bad hip dysplasia are definitely not a candidate for hip arthroscopy. In, in, in fact, uh, it's contraindicated, meaning uh, it goes against the standard of practice. If you have bad hip dysplasia, one of the ways we get into the hip to do our work is we have to actually cut through the ligaments that help add stability to the hip. And even if you repair those perfectly, they're never as strong as they once were. And so you can actually cause some pretty rapidly progressive arthritis in someone with hip dysplasia if you do a hip scope. Now, Sean, there are some people, are there some people that get labral repairs and osteotomies? Is that something that people are doing? Yeah, yeah, that's something that's uh, recognized more and more because you can, um, go in there arthroscopically and fix the labrum and then perform the periastabular osteotomy or the PAO. Um, and as we understand the labrum more and its suction seal effect, it's nice to have that repaired at the same time. Um, and it can be addressed either within uh, the same day or it can be addressed at a different time if it becomes an issue. Um, that is a little bit less clear about when it should happen, but certainly people can be candidates for both at the same time. Um, so I just wanted to touch on some other causes of hip pain. So it's not always in the joint. We talked about this before. There are several layers that are kind of highlighted here. Um, you can see the muscles overlapping the hip joint. This is the main hip joint now covered with the capsule. You can see this is the psoas tendon. This causes people problems a lot of time. These are the big uh, muscles on the outside of the hip that help stabilize the pelvis when you walk. And so a lot of people will have pain on the outside of the hip and we call that traditionally trochanteric bursitis, but it probably encompasses a little bit more. And now we kind of lean toward this terminology of greater trochanteric pain syndrome, just meaning that there's something around that big bony prominence on the outside of the hip that's causing an issue. And much like the shoulder where you can have rotator cuff tears, you can tear those tendons on the outside of the hip. And so this is an MRI of a lady that we reconstructed her abductor tendon on because she had a chronic tear in her hip. Um, and so we fix that. Uh, we do that both arthroscopic and open depending on how long it's been there and how far it's retracted. Uh, you know, again, we have our standard treatment protocols for pure bursitis. Those tend to get better with a little steroid uh, action and some PT. It's commonly caused by some tendonitis of the abductor tendon and just general weakness. As we get older, we get the muscles get a little bit weaker. We get set in our movement patterns, and that recreates this problem over time uh, that uh, physical therapists are pretty good at fixing. Uh, injections are good at getting rid of that immediate pain to make the PT a little bit more effective. And then if there is a tear, then we repair it because it probably is going to do a lot better if you just get it back to normal anatomy. And then uh, buttock pain, pain in the butt. I get a lot of people coming in saying they can't sit down, the sit bone hurts. It's a real pain in the you know what. Um, and there's a couple causes for that. One of the most common ones is hamstring injury. So runners for sure get a lot of hamstring tendonitis right here where it attaches to the sit bone. Um, water skiers traditionally either have tears or tendonitis from this. 
Um, and athletes frequently will have some hamstring problems, but it's not always uh, athletes. Uh, as we get older, again, tendons just kind of tend to degenerate, and wherever they're feeling the most amount of stress, uh, that's where they tend to start falling apart. And I get a lot of elderly patients that hike still are very active and, and young in nature. The age number might not show up, but they're very active and young, and they have this pain, and sometimes we'll see a full-on hamstring tear. Um, I, this was from a lady who was a CrossFitter. She was 62, went to do some sprints and felt the pop in her hip. And then you can see the edge of her hamstring tendon right here when it's supposed to attach right here on the bone. So we went in and repaired that. So any kind of acute tears, meaning they just happened from a trauma like that wind sprint uh, CrossFit activity, uh, the partial tears, uh, sometimes we try to get away with physical therapy, especially if it's just tendonitis. Maybe we offer an injection, uh, cortisone or PRP in that location. PRP is kind of great for that, for tendonitis, actually. Um, now, if the partial tear extends a little bit further and involves more tendons, uh, which there are three that normally attach there, then we talk about maybe we just need to do surgery and reattach it to, again, restore normal anatomy. So that's all I have. Well, that was great, Sean. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise. I know that um, I am personally very glad that you're part of the group. And I think that having your sort of unique skill set really adds to the level of care that we can provide for our patients. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to come and share what it is that you what it is that you do to help patients with their hip pain and, and, and help our patients to kind of better understand how our practices overlap. Um, and so I appreciate you also answering my questions and now's a good opportunity and Sean has agreed um, to answer some live questions. So what we'll do is there'll be a brief delay and then um, we'll have Dr. Halliman uh, log in and answer anybody's questions. So again, thank you so much um, for taking the time, sharing your expertise. That was awesome, appreciate it a ton. Um, and look forward to uh, your answers for some questions from our patients. So thank you. And thanks everyone for taking the time uh, to listen to this. Uh, we have our next uh, episode coming up next month, which I'm excited about. I'm gonna take you into the operating room and show you some of the tools that we use at the time of surgery, we have some, some fake uh, hips that are made out of plastic. They'll show you some of the saws and the reamers and some of the power tools that we use, so that'll be really fun. Uh, but now let's switch over and go to Dr. Halliman with some live questions. Thank you, Dr. Alton. appreciate being here. Thanks, Sean.